For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you may be rooted and grounded in love, so that you might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now, Father, we sang it, we just read of it, and that is certainly our prayer as Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. We ask that you would fill us up with a full and a broader knowledge of your great love for us and for the people of this world to whom your son gave himself. We acknowledge that even as Paul taught the Ephesians that your love cannot be isolated from your justice and your wrath and really only understood in light of that. And so as we open your word today, we need you to help us to open our hearts. Thank you that you didn't abandon us as orphans, but just as you promised, Lord Jesus, you sent the Spirit. Spirit, we thank you for your ministry in our lives to illumine truth and to convict the minds of those who've never met you of sin and righteousness and judgment. So help me today and fill me and anoint me and use me in the meetings that will follow this afternoon and then tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the prophet Malachi chapter four. If you're new to the Bible, it's easy to find. Just find the first page of the New Testament, Matthew, and turn back a page and you will be in Malachi chapter four. This is a little gem of a prophecy. I love the prophet Malachi. His name literally means my messenger. And so this book, as every book of the Bible, is written by the Holy Spirit of God. But in this case, it's penned through this prophet. And he was a prophet of God who prepared the people of Israel, not just for the first coming of the Messiah, but he also looks down the corridors of time to the second coming when the Messiah will come again. And let me just say, you've heard me say it before, that if you really want to get a handle on any book of the Bible, you need to get the big picture. And when you have the big picture, the component parts can take on much more meaning. And the way to do that is just to read a book over and over and over again, and you'll begin to see its structure. And so let me just set the broad context and then the immediate context. Uh, It's been a little while since we've been in Malachi. If you remember, as this chart reminds us, the book divides into three major sections. The prophet opens the book with the declaration of God's love in the first five verses. And he is reminding the people who are doubting God's love, do you really love us? And so God takes the time and he demonstrates to them his care in the past as he uh, contrasts the Edomites with the Israelite people. And by the way, all the way through this book, even in every section, he highlights different sins of the people. And in this particular section, they were doubting the love of God. That was the first hang-up. And the way you can identify these hang-ups are very, very simple. He will uh, introduce each of these sins with a statement followed by a question. Malachi will say, this is what the Lord says. And then he'll say, but you say, or yet you say. And so that phrase, but you say, yet you say, appears seven times highlighting six specific sins. You come to the second section in Malachi 1, 6 through 3, 15. And there he highlights the disloyalty in God's people. And so what we find in the second section is God's complaint in the present. And he accuses them of showing more respect to the governor, some secular leader, than they do to God Almighty. And so if you remember, they were guilty of despising God's name, like he were a cheap God. And they brought their leftovers, their blemished sacrifices, instead of worshiping God with their best. Then we saw in chapter 2 and in verse 14, the people debasing God's covenant. God calls us when we're married to make a covenant with our spouse. It's a promise. It's a vow. And in the Old Testament, God pictures his relationship with Israel through marriage and under the new covenant in a fuller way, God pictures his relationship with all his people, Jew and Gentile alike, as uh, through marriage as it pictures Christ's relationship to the church. But what were they doing? They were divorcing their wives, they were breaking their covenants, 
And so God will say, I, the God of Israel, hate divorce. Not divorce people, but divorce. It is nonetheless a sin that they were guilty of. Then we saw beyond debasing God's covenant, they were debating God's justice. Is God really just? Does he really care about what is happening in this world? Why do such bad things happen to good people and seemingly bad people experiencing such good things? And then in chapter 3 and verse 8, maybe the only section most have ever heard preached in Malachi, they were depleting God's storehouse. They were robbing God in their tithes, in their offerings. And then in 3.13, where we were last time, they were depreciating God's service. They question, does it really pay to serve the Lord? And so last time we crossed over into the third section, which continues here in chapter 4, and the focus is on the deliverance by God's servants. And the focus is um, God's coming in the future. And if you remember, God assures the people that he has a book of remembrance. And the time is coming when the wicked will meet God in judgment but God will reward his people. And that's taught not just in the Old Testament, but the New Testament. The next three Wednesday nights, you do not want to miss because we're going to focus specifically on that. Nonetheless, the righteous will be blessed and rewarded and the wicked will be judged. And so in this final section, he's really responding to their criticism that it's vain to serve the Lord, that it doesn't really pay to serve God. And so in the first three verses of the fourth chapter, he's going to remind them a day is coming when the righteous will be rescued. Messiah, Christ, Jesus will come back and he will rule and reign on the earth. That's an Old Testament doctrine. All the way through the Old Testament law and the prophets and the Psalms, God speaks of two comings of the Messiah. The first in redemption, the second to rule and reign. He came to a cradle that led to a cross, but ultimately he will come back to a crown. And then in the final section of the book that we'll look at next time, he speaks of this final warning before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And we'll see that he will send back the prophet Elijah. Not only is Christ coming again, the prophet Elijah is coming again. And the Lord Jesus affirmed that truth as well in the Gospels. And so what Malachi is saying, obviously, looks not just at their day as he gives them hope that someday Messiah will come and rule and reign, but we will experience that. Paul says we will rule and reign with him. And so all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. This is not simply what God has said. This is what God is saying And I hope we have ears to hear it this morning. Now, zooming in on the immediate context, we read at the end of chapter 3 of that faithful remnant in the day when God will come and he will not forsake them. Again, he recorded all their acts in a book of remembrance. And God underscores that those who fear the Lord and esteem his name will be rewarded. Look at uh, this group as they're described in Malachi 3 and verse 17. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. Says Yahweh of, of angels, you could, rem- you could render it. Yahweh of hosts, God has angelic hosts. The word host is used in scripture, both of the stars above, but in many, many contexts of this mass number of angels. And so they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day that I prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And so God refers to this believing remnant as his own possession. The ESV says his treasured possession. The old English says my jewels. It's a Hebrew noun that refers to something of great value. And that's how God views you if you are one of his. You are a person of great value, so much so that he bought you not with silver or gold, but he redeemed you with his precious blood. And we're living in a day where he's polishing these gems uh, through trials, through tribulations. But someday we will shine in all the beauty and splendor that God designed us for when our salvation is complete. And so look at verse 18. He makes it very clear. So you will again distinguish between the righteous, that's one group, 
and the wicked, that's another group, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. Now, that was last time. That brings us into the context this morning. I want to begin reading Malachi chapter 4. Follow along as we read the first three verses. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Now, if you don't know it, it's obvious that we're living in a very dark time in human history. It's dark domestically, internationally, spiritually, morally. I was reading again this week what has happened in less than 80 years. If you're a young person in 1960 attending the government school system, every day started with a prayer, a simple innocuous prayer praying for Uh, the students, the teachers, the school, and for yourself. There was a Bible reading in most schools, not all, but most schools, and then the Pledge of Allegiance was said. And indeed, we were much more at that time one nation under God. The Lord in many ways was still being honored, but not anymore. God has been thrown out, and there has been evil that has filled that vacuum. And sadly today, secular humanism seems to be the subject, critical race theory, socialism, Marxism, intersectionality, and the biblical morality that our nation was once founded on has been totally eradicated. And so with God gone, we have these young people who are learning more philosophy than they're learning basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. And when this this nation once led in those realms... Now we're like 28th out of the nations of the world. Now let me just say parenthetically, I'm grateful for those people who are listening, some who are present, who have been called of God to make a difference or to try to make a difference in the government school system. But with that said, I think in the day that we live in, it would be very foolish to send your children there for eight hours a day from kindergarten through high school and expect to have a godly product at the end. We have a day when parents just don't care. They don't care so much that they'll bring their children to the local public library where a man is dressed up like a woman or a woman is dressed up like a man and they'll let them read to their children. This is a culture with a depraved mind, a warped and perverted culture and so they'll teach our children about protective sex and that homosexuality and your ability to change your gender, transgenderism and all the like are normal. And if this administration has their way, they'll start indoctrinating children as early as kindergarten as they already are in many states across America. And kindergartners will believe what they're told just like they'll believe there's a fat man who comes down every chimney in the world called Santa Claus. And many people who choose Christian education do so because they want to guide their children spiritually and morally. And uh, sadly, many have ignored this option. And we wonder why, if Barna is right, 78% of young people, by the time they get to college, I'm talking about young people raised in the evangelical church, Bible-believing churches, have walked away from the Christian faith. Because the scripture warns us. Paul said, I'll have you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. He also tells the Corinthians that bad company corrupts good morals. And that's true not just of children, that's true of adults. And that's why I often tell people when we do our annual home education seminar that home education or any kind of Christian school be it in a school, a home school, or some hybrid uh, setting, is not a magic bullet. That if the parents are trafficking in filth themselves, then they will undo all the goals that they may have for their children. But if you're walking with the Lord, doesn't matter how dark the culture will get, 
The scripture promises, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Listen to the major offenses that were unfolding in the government school system 40 years ago. Talking out of turn, chewing gum, running in the halls, making noise, not putting paper in the wastebaskets, getting out of turn in line. That was pretty much my day in grammar school, though it was changing. As of 2023, here's some of the top offenses. Rape, robbery, assault, personal theft, absenteeism, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, bombings, arson, carrying of weapons, vandalism, mass shootings, extortion, gang warfare, unwed pregnancies, abortion, suicide, lying, cheating, bullying, gender dysphoria, fornication, homosexuality, and transgenderism. Children are being indoctrinated, and they are being bullied by those who don't think like Christians. You send your child as a Christian to the government school system, and they represent a minority. They stick out like a sore thumb. And most of those children at that young age do not have the spiritual steel in their spine to deal with that. The scripture warns, he who walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And by the way, the companion of fools can sometimes take place with those little handheld computers you give your children. You need to give a lot of thought when you think your child is ready for their own personal cell phone. And some children fall victim of bullying and group think and they have a low self-esteem. In 1960, here's where we've gone since 1960, approximately 200,000 couples lived together unmarried. As of last year, it's risen to 7.5 million. The family is coming unraveled. And for the first time in American history, as of three years ago, half of all American children born are being raised in a single parent home or by a step parent. And sadly, 40% of all the children who are born in America are born to a single mom who's not married. And by the way, there are no illegitimate children, only illegitimate parents. And we care for single mothers in this church. We want to help these women. We want to come alongside and minister to them. But we must teach God's standards or we'll become part of the culture around us. Forty years ago, our government spoke about a sexual revolution. Well, we've had a sexual revolution and it's revolting. And so Malachi is speaking of a future day. He addresses not just the first coming of the Messiah, as we saw in the third chapter, but here in this fourth chapter, the time Messiah will return. When he came the first time, it was a very dark time in human history. And when he comes again, the scripture affirms it will be the same kind of dark moral tone. And so three times here in this chapter of Scripture, he speaks of a day. Notice in verse 1, for behold, the day is coming. Circle that word, the day. In verse 3, he speaks of the day which I am preparing. Circle those two words, the day. And then next time, we'll come to verse 5 where he writes of the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So there's a new day coming, and there are three truths about this new day that I want to underscore in our thinking. If you're new, there's a note-taking outline. If you're live streaming, you can print it out online. The first aspect of this day is that God's day is a day of retribution. God's day is a day of retribution. The Bible very clearly teaches, as one famous pastor preached 60 years ago, payday is coming someday. And it will be someday, and for some it will be a great day of rejoicing, but for others it will be a day of moaning and groaning. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus in John the fifth chapter. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those who did the good, you'll see deeds are in italics. It's not part of the original. Italics in the Bible are not used for emphasis, but to show words that are not in the original, but sometimes are implied or have to be put in a particular language, the receptor language, to make it make sense. But he's speaking about those who do the good, meaning deeds or works, to a resurrection of life. 
those who committed the evil deeds or works to a resurrection of judgment. Now, the Bible teaches you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, and you could read these verses at first glance and think that Jesus is teaching salvation by works. He is not. In the verses prior to this, he taught you're saved not by works, but by grace alone. But while we're saved by grace alone, the grace that saves is never alone. When you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, the direction of your life changes. No new direction, it just means you've had no new birth. And so good works are the evidence of those who are born again. They'll come to a resurrection of life, an evil lifestyle. It might be self-righteousness. It might be downright hardcore evil to a resurrection of judgment. So now he goes on to underscore three aspects of this coming day of retribution. Point A on your outline. The day of retribution is a future day. It is a future day. Again, we just read in verse 1, for behold, the day is coming. Now, it's very important for us to understand that this day is still in the future. Don't get the idea that God's final judgment for sin is taking place today because it's not. It's still in the future. However, there is an aspect of God's retribution that is being expressed today. Hold your finger here and turn to the book of Romans. If you're new to the Bible, you're in Malachi. The next book is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, which covers 30 years of church history. And then you come to the book of Romans. Romans is what often is called the constitution of Christianity. It is one of the most complete documents in the New Testament describing and highlighting all the great truths that every believer should know. Chapters 1 through 8 are the doctrinal section. It deals with the doctrine of condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification. 9 through 11 is the national section. He ends 8 by saying nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he illustrates that in 9 through 11 with the people of Israel. That even though they were disobedient and hardened towards the Messiah, though God elected them, chapter 9, though they rejected him, chapter 10, chapter 11, someday they will respond to him. And then you, in chapters 12 through 16, you come to the applicational section. Here in Romans 1, what God does, we were here, by the way, four years ago next month. We looked at this section of Scripture. But in this particular passage, he describes what happens to a person, what happens to a nation when they put God off. Look at Romans 1 and verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, please notice, he does not say the wrath of God will be revealed but the wrath of God is revealed. You might want to circle that little present tense uh, verb is. The wrath of God is revealed because God's wrath, his holy hatred for sin has several dimensions. There's certainly God's cataclysmic wrath that speaks of events like the great flood or Sodom and Gomorrah or the great tribulation. But then there's God's future wrath that Paul speaks about to the church at Thessalonica, what he calls the wrath of God to come, that final and ultimate expression of wrath in the place called hell, the lake of fire. But there's the wrath of abandonment, that current expression of wrath that we can see even today. And it's not like a lightning bolt from heaven. It's a dimension of God's wrath that works quietly and invisibly and unfolds with time. And it happens, according to verse 18, to those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And by the way, this wrath is operating across America, and just not America, but across our world. These people who suppress the truth, verse 19 tells us, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Well, how has God made it evident to them, Paul? Well, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Ever since the creation of the world, God's attributes, his power and nature are clearly seen. 
So no one can say, is there a God? Does God exist? Because the creation shouts of the creator. And that's why I will tell you many times, there's no such thing as an atheist. When you're sharing with someone who says they're an atheist or an agnostic, you already know better. They already know there is a God. But nonetheless, God who reveals himself in creation, among other ways, we read in verse 21, for even though they knew God, that is, they knew that there is a God who exists. They knew God not in the way that a born-again believer knows the Lord, for this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God. That's the personal relationship that comes through a second birth. But they know God and that they know God exists, as do the demons. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Instead, Paul tells us, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And so when a nation or an individual has light and that nation or that individual suppresses that light, then God takes away the light of revelation of himself. And so there are people today who say they are enlightened in the evangelical Bible-believing church are darkened and narrow-minded. And the scripture would say just the opposite. They are the people who are darkened in their understanding. They have what Paul will call a foolish heart. Remember what Jesus said to the unsaved Jews in his day and to the unbelieving Gentiles. He said in John 12, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. Look, it's dangerous for a person or for a nation to be exposed to the light of God's truth and creation and conscience and to suppress it. And that's why in verse 22, the apostle will write, professing to be wise, they became fools. Now they think they're bright and wise. God's assessment of them is they are fools. And their foolishness can be seen according to verse 23 and that they exchanged the glory of the corruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. May I remind you that one-third of the world today still practices this kind of idolatry. We have many people in our church who are from India. That nation is covered over. India now is the largest nation on the planet. China is second. Pakistan is third. If you reach just those three countries alone, you've reached about 4 billion of the 8.4 billion on the planet. But understand, idolatry can have many expressions. Paul can say greed, even sexual immorality, is idolatry. And my, that is an idol in our nation. Peace, people worship immorality. Therefore, verse 24... God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature themselves rather than the creator who is blessed forever. That was the 1960s, 70s, and 80s as our nation began to change. Though it was passed in the 20s, we officially began to teach the doctrine of evolution. God didn't create your children you evolved here. We outlawed Bible reading. We outlawed the ability to pray in schools. The Ten Commandments that were virtually on every schoolroom wall in America were now removed. And so instead of believing the God who created the world, we are now embraced the theory of evolution. And people today, they, they worship the environment. They worship their carbon footprint, renewable energy, and all kinds of things. And this is a picture of man suppressing truth. It's the wrath of abandonment. They say we're stupid, that we're in darkness. God says they're in darkness. They're acting foolishly as they worship the creation rather than the creator God who made these things. When a person or a nation continues in that, they go deeper into sin. And so three times over in this chapter, it says God gave them over. You should underline that. In verse 24, therefore God gave them over. We, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Then in verse 26, he writes, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. 
Homosexuality can have different causes, but in this context, it's a judgment of God. People who've suppressed what they knew to be true, they go from sensuality to homosexuality. And then in verse 28, he adds, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. For God to give someone over to a depraved mind, this is the wrath of God that is being revealed. And again, sadly, in 1960, fortunately, we only had two sexually transmitted diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea. Now we have 20 sexually transmitted diseases. And if the CDC statistics were accurate last month, they say now one in five Americans have an STD. They just reported also in September that an epidemic is sweeping the United States and Europe of these diseases and a pandemic in South Africa, Brazil, and Puerto Rico. People sometimes ask, well, is this a judgment of God? Well, not entirely. For every kick, there's a kick back. Sometimes God just lets us go our way and we experience the consequences of the choices that we have made. And we get these diseases. Why? Because God, by design, made sex a closed system. And as long as it's a closed system, we're not going to inherit these kinds of things. And so here are these people in Malachi's day. Go back to Malachi for just a moment. No, just, no, stay in Romans. I'm not quite done. I want to look at one other verse. <laughs> but here are these people in Malachi's day who are wondering, Lord, what's going on? Remember, it was a dark day. You read some of the parallel prophets. Now, Haggai and Zechariah preached a little bit before him, and Malachi does the cleanup. But when you read these prophets, you discover here at the end of the Old Testament age, it is a very dark time in human history. What are you doing about it, God? God is patiently waiting. He's long-suffering. King David said it this way in Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. And then he quickly adds, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. There's coming a day, David says, when the patience of God will give out where the dam of God's mercy will break to his wrath. We're seeing that today in terms of the wrath of abandonment. But Malachi is going to speak of this future wrath. Now turn over a page to Romans 2 for just a moment. Romans chapter 2. I want you to see what the apostle says about this coming future day of wrath that Malachi is going to camp on for us. In Romans chapter 2 and in verse 5, he's describing the unrepentant Jew and the unrepentant religious Gentile who refuse to admit their need for a Savior. And he says in verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. His point is they're storing up wrath. You know, Jesus said we're to treasure up, we're to store up treasure in heaven. He uses the identical Greek words, the Apostle Paul, but he uses it in a reverse way. People who are treasuring up or storing up wrath in heaven. Why? Because of their habitual refusal to respond. And the longer we refuse to respond, if we die in that state, we've added to the eternal retribution that God will someday bring. Now remember, Malachi, we studied in chapter three, many of God's people had concluded it doesn't seem to pay to serve God. Look at all these pagans around us. They seem to be prospering. We're not prospering. Like so many of the old covenant believers, they were being persecuted. How does it pay to serve God? It seems to be a vain activity. And Malachi is going to remind them, look, there's coming a future judgment when God is going to settle accounts. Go back to chapter 3, if you will, in verse 14. Notice he said, you have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is, is it that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. The people are belly aching. They're complaining. God, you told us to test you with the tithe. And they're testing you with sin. And they're prospering and you're not doing anything. 
You're letting these evil people get away with it. And so again, he opens this chapter, for behold, the day is coming. That's the first truth. You can get disillusioned. You can see all the evil and all the wicked, bad things that are happening. We've just witnessed one of the most horrible things in Israel on October the 7th. And those of you who are following what's going on in India, most of it is not even broadcast on the news. There's virtual silence. The same kind of Hamas kind of evil where people are being beheaded, children are being burned alive, women are being abused is going across northern India because these people followed Jesus. And so he wants us to know a day is coming. It's a future day. Secondly, the day of retribution is not only a future day, it is a fiery day. It's a fiery day. Let me read further into verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze. Now, notice how this verse begins with a little three-letter word, for. I told you some time ago that my Hebrew Bible only has three chapters to the prophet Malachi. It has the exact same verses, but three chapters. They just divide it a little bit differently. Remember, almost a, a millennium after the Bible was um, written, did we add chapter and verse divisions so that we could find our way around. And they virtually have all the same divisions, but not everywhere, just like there are some other languages, like uh, the Slavic languages. They divide some of the Psalms, for instance, a little bit differently and so on. But I think actually the division in the Hebrew Bible is helpful. They don't end in verse 18. They go on in chapter 3 with verses 19, 21, 22, 23, all the way to verse 24. Six more verses. Because what we're finding here is an explanation for what is going to happen. We just read in verse 18. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, the one who serves God and the one who does not. How will they do that? For here's the reason. And in verse 1, he describes a burning like furnace against the wicked and the one who does not serve him that are described here in verse 1 as the evildoer. And by the way, by nature, I'm an evildoer. I'm a wicked person, according to Scripture. The heart is desperately wicked. And only a second birth can rescue you such that you will be deemed righteous, credited with the righteousness of Christ such that you would want to serve the Lord. But understand, all the way through Scripture, we've already seen it through the words of Jesus and the words of Paul. And now in Malachi, you're either righteous or you're unrighteous, you're wicked. Either serve God or you don't. There's no such thing as neutrality. You're in one group or the other. And by the way, when Jesus describes hell, he describes it in the same fashion that Malachi does. Let me read to you Matthew 25, 41. He says, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In Mark 9, 48, he describes it as a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. In the Revelation, the apostle John said this, he said, hell is the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And we just read in 2 Thessalonians 1, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. He is going to deal out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey. And the word obey is hupa um, akuo. It means to listen under. To those who do not submit, you could say, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And so the Bible is crystal clear that when Christ comes back, he's coming back in flaming fire, what Malachi calls burning like a furnace. Now, save the letters. Don't write me. Every time I speak on hell, I get some kickback. They say, well, pastor, don't you know that God is a God of love? Of course I do. He is a God of infinite love. But he is also a God of righteous wrath. It's interesting. There's only a handful of times in the New Testament where it says God is. For instance, John 4, 24 declares God is spirit. Uh, 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. And in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, it says, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes, God is love, but God in his justice is also a consuming fire. 
And if you've never met Christ in salvation, you will meet God in his wrath as a consuming fire. Now, I know the error, it seems, is gone when men preach about the doctrine of hell. And certainly, there was a time when a lot of pulpits spoke of hellfire and damnation, and maybe to some extent in an unbalanced way where they didn't speak enough of the grace of God that is provided. But now today we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater and you will rarely ever hear a sermon on the eternal retribution of God. And so just because men are not talking about it has not changed one bit God's holy hatred for sin. Listen, the Lord Jesus taught more about the doctrine of hell than any other person in all the Bible. The one who's incarnate love tells us more about hell. He knew it was so horrible, he was willing to step out of glory and to take on our humanity and go to a cross. And if you die and go to hell, you'll have no one to blame but yourself because the God who set the penalty provided a way of escape. He paid the penalty. But you can't emphasize the love of God apart from the wrath of God. They fit hand in glove. You can't understand the love of God completely. And unless you understand the wrath of God. And when you take part of the truth and you make it all of the truth, then it becomes a half-truth and really in the end an untruth. And so God is love, but he is coming back in flaming fire. You say, I don't like a religion that's built on fear. Well, whether you like it or not doesn't change the truth. Listen to the words of Hebrews 11 describing Noah by faith. Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. In like fashion, in 2 Corinthians 5, when Paul gives us motivations for sharing the gospel, he speaks of both the fear of God and the love of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, he says, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, that he who lives should no longer live for himself, but for him who died and was raised again on our behalf. He's speaking of the love of God, but he also speaks of the fear of the Lord. He'll say in verse 11 of that chapter, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Listen, one of the reasons evangelism is so anemic in the American church is because the average Christian lacks compassion for lost people. And the reason he or she lacks compassion for lost people is because they do not really have planted in their heart and mind and reverberating in their soul what God says about coming retribution. When I find myself often in what I would call a private conversation, a divine appointment, and I pray for them every week, what begins to go through my heart and mind is, is this person headed for heaven or is this person headed for hell? If I care enough about this person and God has brought this person my way, then I'm going to look to the Lord to give me that open door to share the gospel. In July 16, 1741, Jonathan Edwards preached one of the most famous sermons in American history, Sinners in the hand of an angry God. The modern pulpit would never preach such a sermon today. Today, God is our best buddy. In fact, we have evangelical presses, they call themselves evangelical, who are even printing books that say that hell someday will be burned out for the lost people. Listen, you need to know what the scripture says about the doctrine of hell for two primary reasons. Number one, it will help you to understand so much more your own salvation. If hell is the ultimate expression of God's wrath towards sin, then the cross had to at least meet that. It had to at least be equal to that for you to be forgiven. But secondly, if you get a grip on God's holy hatred for sin, then it will motivate you to share people. You will take more seriously the command, go and preach the gospel to all of creation. And many times in Scripture, a command is enough, and that's all that needs to be said. But in this instance, God not only gives us the command, he gives us the motivation for, for warning people. And I know people have trouble with the doctrine of hell. It's often been said if the Supreme Court could outlaw it, they would as cruel and unjust punishment. But it is a place 
that men will literally spend in eternity. And third, not only is the day of retribution future, not only is it fiery, the Bible teaches the day of retribution is a forever day. It's a forever day. Malachi uses language here in verse one to help us understand the state of the unsaved that can never be changed. Notice now the beginning of, or the middle of verse one. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. By the way, I should say parenthetically that Malachi 4.1 is a favorite verse of cults and liberal Protestants. Cults like Jehovah's Witness and Seventh-day Adventists teach that the state of lost people is what we call annihilationism. That they're just consumed. Some say JWs in the dust of the ground. Seventh-day Adventists, they're just burned and annihilated in hell, but that's the end of it, that it's not eternal. And liberal Protestants do the same thing. They teach annihilationism, and they'll use this text of Scripture, the final phrase, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. And they argue that the destruction of the lost is so complete that it's not eternal. So how do we respond to that? Well, again, the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture itself. And if you believe, as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that every single word, every letter was inspired by God the Spirit, then God who inspired it wrote it without error. And you need to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And so that, understand, think, think with me for a second. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about what happened to that place. It was burned into oblivion. I mean, there was nothing left. Genesis 19 and verse 25 said, it was burned so deeply with fire and brimstone that, quote, nothing could grow on the ground. Malachi is using similar imagery. He speaks here of neither root nor branch. And again, with that said, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, their bodies were destroyed. Did that mean that they who lived in those bodies were destroyed? Not at all, Jesus taught to the contrary. In Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus is dealing what we often call that triangular, uh, those three cities, who had received more miracles and witnessed more of his teaching than any other, and he gives these series of woes, and so he says, nevertheless I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom, meaning the people who lived in and around that city, in the day of judgment than for you. And though Sodom had been destroyed for millennia, Jesus is underscoring the people of Sodom are still very much alive. In fact, in the book of Jude, Jude 7, remember there's just one chapter, so we won't typically say Jude 1 colon 7, we just say Jude 7. That's a commercial for those of you who are new to the Bible. Um, he says this, that the people of Sodom are exhibited as an example and undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. I was thinking this week of what will happen when Jesus comes back and he deals with this one world leader known as the Antichrist. Paul will write in 2 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 8, and then that lawless one, the Antichrist, by the way, there's 30 plus titles that are given to the Antichrist. The most popular is only used once. Uh, the most repeated is the beast. But there are over 30 titles, and here it's the lawless one. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So when Jesus comes back, just by the breath of his mouth, that man will be destroyed. Does that mean he will be annihilated and he'll cease to exist? Not at all. Listen to what John says in John 19, 20, describing the return of Jesus. The only thing that is destroyed is his career and his influence. But of the beast, the Antichrist, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, 666, and those who worshiped his image, these two were thrown alive. This is a reverse rapture of sorts. I will be raptured in the twinkling of an eye and get a new body suited for heaven. These are the first two occupants in hell. The devil's not in hell. No one's in hell yet. They're in a place of judgment. The current day, called, current day hell called Hades 
but the lake of fire is still future. And these are the first two occupants, and they're thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. So while he is slain with the breath of Jesus' mouth, they are thrown alive into the fire. You know, every Easter, most evangelical churches are our own included. We have record numbers of people who will come. And some of our visitors come lost, and sadly, many of them leave lost. And I'm not sure why they always come or what they're celebrating, especially if they're not saved. Because the message of the resurrection, of Christ's resurrection, not only guarantees that this mortality will put on immortality, that this perishable will put on the imperishable, that I'll get a new body. It also guarantees that they will receive a new body. Again, we've already read from John 5, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth, those who did the good to a resurrection of life, those who did the evil to a resurrection of judgment. And just as my body in its current state is not suited for heaven, neither is their body suited for hell. Because in hell the fire never ends and the worm never dies and people are there forever. Listen again to what Paul said. I want to add one verse to it that we didn't read from 2 Thessalonians 1. Christ will be dealing out retribution to those who don't know God, to those who don't know how to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty, underscore in your mind, of eternal. Ionios, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This adjective, eternal ionios, is the same adjective that is used in 1 Timothy to describe the eternal God. It's the same adjective that is used in John 3, 16 to modify eternal life. It's the same adjective that's used in Matthew 25 to describe eternal death. If God is not forever, then heaven is not forever and hell is not forever but you cannot come to that conclusion. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of the 19th century once said, in hell there is no hope. They do not even have the hope of dying. They are forever, forever lost. On every chain in hell there is written forever. Their eyes are galled and their hearts are pained with the thought that it is forever. Now people can say it will be burned out, but that's not what the Bible teaches. And so your argument will not be with me. It will be with Scripture. And that's why I tell people, you don't want to, you don't want to get this one wrong. I just preached a funeral, and I know there were people who were present at that funeral who didn't know the Lord. And as I describe the glories and wonders of heaven where my mother-in-law was, as wonderful as heaven is, so bad as hell it's an awful place, and when a person has been there a hundred billion years, he'll not have one less second to spend there. You don't want to get this wrong. You want to have this settled because there's coming a day of retribution. Secondly, here in your outline, not only is God's day a day of retribution, God's day is a day of restoration. It's a day of restoration. Look now at verse 2. But for you who fear my name, I hope that's you, for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. The Lord Jesus, the S-O-N, is compared to the S-U-N that shines bright in the sky. And it's not surprising that Malachi would make this comparison because Jesus uses similar imagery. In John 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. Concerning the Messiah, the prophet Isaiah wrote in the ninth chapter, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And we know this applies to Jesus because verses four through six of that chapter are messianic. In fact, every Jew confesses this is a messianic passage. And it's a passage that describes what will happen when Messiah comes back a second time. And just like when it's dark and you expect the sun to come up, you can expect Jesus to come back. He ascended to the Father, and as we move through this age, just as the Bible predicts, things aren't going to get better. Jesus thought at the end, things are gonna get darker and darker and darker. 
but I'm waiting for the sun to come back. I'm waiting for the sunrise. And listen, just as the S-U-N has its own inherent light, and the moon is a reflection of the sun's light, Jesus inherently is the light of the world, and we are to reflect him. And just like when it's dark, you expect the S-U-N to come up again, you can bank on it that the S-O-N is in charge, and he is coming back again. And the scripture says when he comes back, he will bring righteousness on this earth. So let me underscore three promises that are made about this coming day of restoration. Point A, he will restore your darkness into light. He'll restore your darkness into light. We read now in verse 2, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise. Now that's what the sunrise does. It brings light. If you're in a dark, dark room, how do you get rid of the darkness? My wife and I and children one day were in these caves in North Carolina, and the guide turned off the lights, and he said, I need every phone off, everything off. And he said, this may be the only time in your life, maybe the first time in your life, where you were in total darkness. You couldn't see there in those Linville Caverns. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Now, how do you get rid of the darkness? Well, my daughter got rid of it. She turned on this big video camera, and all of a sudden, (laughs) you don't vacuum out the darkness. You don't curse the darkness. You turn on a light. And that's what Jesus is going to do. And of course, the concept of light and darkness is not only used literally in Scripture, but it's used metaphorically in two ways. One, morally, and secondly, intellectually. It's used morally, where light represents purity and darkness represents evil. Isaiah 5 and verse 20 describes it morally. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Paul employs the same imagery in Romans 13. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And so when Jesus comes, the darkness will flee and all the wickedness and vileness in this world will be eradicated. But it's not only used morally, the scripture uses light and darkness intellectually, where light pictures God's truth, God's revelation, where darkness pictures man's warped way of thinking. And so the scripture can say, for instance, in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Jesus contrasted light and darkness in this same way. If you remember in John chapter 9 with the blind man who was blind physically and blind spiritually and with the Pharisees who were, had sight physically but were blind spiritually. In the end, the blind man can see physically and he can see spiritually. Whereas the Pharisees can see physically, but they can't see spiritually. And he said, for judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. And so Malachi wants us to know there's coming a day of restoration when our darkness will be turned into light. And certainly today for the believer, there are some things we just don't understand, do we? Some things happen and we just don't know why. And we sing, we'll understand it better by and by. Paul said, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as I also have been fully known. I told you years ago about a young 35-year-old pastor who lost his wife to cancer. He and his six-year-old daughter, they had gone to the funeral home. He preached his wife's funeral, went to the graveyard. They went home, and members of their church said, why don't you let us take the daughter tonight? You need some time alone. And he said, no, we need to be together. And so as he did every night, he prayed with his daughter. He tucked her in and put her to sleep. And a few minutes later, there was a knock on the door, and the little girl said, Daddy, can I come in? Of course you can. Daddy, it, it's just so dark, I, I'm scared. Can I get in your bed? Yes, get in. And they prayed again, and he turned off the light, 
And a few minutes later, the little girl said, Daddy, it's, it's just so dark in here. I know, honey, it is dark. She said, I don't think I've ever seen it so dark. I don't think I've seen it so dark either. And then she said, Daddy, can you see my face? Is your face towards me? Yes, my face is towards you. With that, she closed her eyes and went off to sleep. And he fell to his knees. He said, Father, it's so dark. I don't think I've ever seen it so dark. Father, is your face towards me? And God whispered from his word, for that's the only way he speaks. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And with that, he went off to sleep. Now, I know some of you are in a very dark time as I have ministered and counseled you in the last few months. And I just want to remind you, though it may seem dark, there are brighter days ahead. God's love and commitment to you has not changed one bit. And Malachi wants us to know that the light of the world is going to come back. John will write in the Revelation that this city we call heaven has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The darkness will flee. He'll restore your darkness into light. Secondly, he'll restore your illness into health. He'll restore your illness into health. There is a healing that takes place ultimately when Christ comes back. Look now, if you will, at verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Now, the Son obviously does not have literal wings, but when it is coming up over the horizon, its rays appear like wings. And here the Scripture refers to the Son with healing in its wings. Many, many times in the last few decades, I've been asked in the Bible line, is there healing in the atonement? And this is a doctrine that is falsely taught by some of our charismatic slash Pentecostal brethren, that just as by faith you believe God to forgive your sin, in the same way by faith you need to believe God to heal you. And if you're not healed, it's your lack of faith, it's your unbelief. And they'll take a verse from Isaiah that is a section of Scripture that deals with what Messiah will do on a cross. And the text says, by his stripes we are healed. And they work these people up and these guys like Copeland and others who have made millions and built innocent people out of their ignorance of Scripture. They've convinced them that they can be healed. Listen, I'm not saying God doesn't heal. And if you have some debilitating disease, some cancer, you should ask God to heal you. I'd rather have him say no to my request than not to make the request at all. But ultimately, the healing is when the Lord comes back. How do I know? Because we have divine commentary. In 1 Peter 2.24, Peter references the prophet Isaiah. And he reminds us that by his stripes we are healed contextually, not physically, but spiritually. That's how he applies it. Now, ultimately, when we get a resurrection body, oh, there will be total healing. Paul speaks of that. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So God does heal, but it's not yet entirely Paul says in Romans 8, we're waiting, we're moaning, we're groaning, we're looking with all of the creation for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. That's what's in view here in verse 2, when we're completely redeemed. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And just as the sun's rays brings healing to the earth, even so when Jesus comes back, and you'll see it fully next week, this whole passage is dealing with the return of Jesus from heaven. He'll complete it. I got a left arm that can only go so straight. But a day is coming when I'll be able to put it out like this one. There'll be no graveyards in heaven. No funeral homes. No goodbyes. No sickness. No disease. 
And God will complete our salvation when the light of the world comes back. And when he comes back, the Bible promises in Revelation 24, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Praise God, hallelujah. When the sun comes up, there's healing. And when the SON returns, we'll see the same thing. Third, not only will he restore your darkness into light, your illness into health, he will restore your captivity into liberty. He'll restore your captivity into liberty. Let's read now all of verse two. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. He's speaking here about liberty for the children of God when our salvation is completed. Remember, we've been justified, declared righteous, saved from the penalty of sin. We are being sanctified from the power of sin, but some dear precious day will be saved from the very presence of sin. And he likens this, when the sun comes up, there's warmth, and the farmer decides it's time to let that calf out of that cold Israeli winter stall. My wife's cousin, her husband, we were there one day and the horse has been locked up for three days. It was bitter cold in South Carolina, cold like we rarely see it. And we were there and he says, it's time to let the horses out. And those horses just went across that yard and were bucking and kicking and like wild broncos. And if you've ever seen an animal that has been locked up and then released, that's what Malachi is picturing here. These calves who've been cooped up in that stall, full of energy, are let out and they're free. And he's using this figure of speech to describe what will happen to us someday. Right now, we groan, we moan, but listen to the words of Romans 8. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And then Paul personifies the creation, awaiting the return of Jesus. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, but also we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Waiting eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. For those of you who have been born again, you already know a measure of freedom. But you haven't seen anything yet. You may even feel in this life hindered, even in your ability to praise and worship and walk with God. There'll be no hindrance in that coming day. And then we will understand what Paul says, that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Quickly, finally, there's God's future day, and it's a day of retribution, it's a day of restoration. Roman numeral three, God's day is a day of righteousness. It's a day of righteousness. A time when righteousness will reign supreme. Verse 3 underscores that truth. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. You and I and every believer throughout the coming ages shall be ultimately the victorious ones. We'll no longer be despised and made fun of and walked on. Righteousness will reign supreme. And he underscores it on three levels, or I'm going to underscore it on three levels. He underscores it on a singular level. But because I need three points, I'm going to underscore it on three levels, all right? First, he's, uh, and I'm going to give you a little biblical eschatology here. On the physical realm, righteousness will reign. Righteousness will reign in the physical realm. Peter in 2 Peter 3 and verse 12 says that we are to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In the physical realm, every vestige of sin will be gone. Now when Jesus comes at his second coming, the earth as we know it will be restored to uh, the Garden of Eden kind of uh, expressions. It will be much like God originally created, but it won't be perfect. 
But God will restore it. He'll regenerate it. It's called, in Jesus' words, the regeneration. But at the end of the millennial reign, when God wraps it all up, he, as Peter tells us, is going to take this earth and he's going to melt it with fire. It's going to be gone like an old garment, Isaiah said. And he'll create a brand new heaven in which there has never been any sin and a brand new earth. There's sin during the millennial reign of Messiah. He's going to create a brand new earth in which righteousness dwells. And the new Jerusalem, John sees, John 21.1, or Revelation 21.1, comes down from heaven and sits on this planet, and it becomes the Father's house, the new Jerusalem, where your loved ones are, if they know Jesus. It becomes the capital city of where we will spend eternity. And so God is going to fix it all up. He will indeed allow righteousness to reign in the physical realm. Secondly, righteousness will also reign in the angelic realm, in the angelic realm. A day is coming when Satan and all his cohorts, his fallen angels, a third of the angels um, uh, went with the evil one, and they're going to go to that place that was prepared for them. Remember in Scripture, hell was never made for man. It was made for the devil and his fallen angels. And so God describes here in the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, it's at the end of the thousand-year reign of Messiah after he'd been locked up for a thousand years. No one during that thousand-year reign who are born through tribulation saints will be able to say, the devil made me do it. The devil will be locked up. He'll have no authority, neither any of his angelic fallen beings. They will respond all by themselves without any help from him. But then he's loosed. And when he's loose, and the devil who deceived them, the scripture says, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the f- beast and the false prophet all are assault. A thousand years later, they're still there. Because man is not annihilated. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan and all of his evil will then become an occupant of hell. And then, of course, the great white throne judgment takes place and all the lost will soon join them. And then there's a third level that Malachi teaches and that is righteousness will reign in the human realm. And that's what we'll focus on in closing. Verse three explicitly says, you will tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Now remember, he's writing to a group of people who are debating God's justice and why is it that he's allowing the wicked to prosper. But someday, sinners will be judged. Someday, they will be, in essence, metaphorically speaking, like ashes under the soles of our feet. It's a future day. It's a fiery day. It's a forever day. God has not forgotten. He sees what is happening in this world. And he's going to restore it. He's going to turn your darkness into light. He's going to restore your illness into health. He'll change your bondage into freedom. And righteousness will rule in the physical universe, in the angelic universe, and indeed in the human realm. It will happen. You say, but pastor, it just seems like the world is getting darker and darker and worse and worse. It is. It's very dark. Jesus said it would get dark. But it's darkest just before the sun comes up. And the S-O-N is coming back. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Our Father, I've preached as best I was able by your help, by your grace. I pray today for someone listening. Maybe they're in Graniteville. Maybe they're in Grays. Maybe they're online. Maybe they're in this room. Maybe they're listening through the radio somewhere, but they are uncertain of their eternal destiny. They want to go to heaven. They think they might, but they don't know. God, help them to get this right. Help them by your spirit to believe what you promised because you cannot lie that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that whoever will call on his name will immediately, eternally, forever be saved. 
help them to recognize that their sin is wrong. It's not worth holding on to. And help them to put their faith where you laid their sin on Christ. Would you do that? Would you say, Lord Jesus, save me? And for many, Father, who have been saved, we don't want to be a part of this anemic generation that cares little for the souls of men and women and boys and girls. Help us to see people with compassion. Help us to realize the horrors of hell, that it was so horrible that Jesus was willing to humble himself to the point of death on a cross that we could escape. Even in this new week, give us opportunities to share the love of the Lord Jesus and to portray you accurately. We ask it in his holy name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing a hymn of invitation. And if in recent days, maybe even today, you made a decision for Christ, the first thing the Lord asks you to do is to make it public. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you during this invitation to come. When you come, you sit on the front row. We don't ask you to give a speech. But as you're introduced, you're saying, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Have you ever done that? Jesus said that if a person is a true believer, they'll be willing to confess him before men. And that should show itself in baptism. Baptism always follows regeneration. Peter said, how can we refuse baptism to these who've received the Spirit just like us? First you're born again, then you're baptized. Scripture is so clear. If you haven't had believer's baptism, I invite you to come. Or maybe you're saved and baptized, but you need a church. You can come as well.